All right. Hello, y'all. Um, happy Tuesday. Um, so today's Tuesday, uh, January 16th. Um, tomorrow, January 17th is Wednesday. We are scheduled to have class, um, but I'm having um, some health issues and I'm going to need to see a doctor tomorrow. Um, so I will not be able to make it to class tomorrow. So um, I'm recording a video for you and we will have a virtual lecture in lieu of in-person class tomorrow. Um, so I, ha I did want to let you know, I'm going to send an email to include this as well, um, but your section 2.1 and 2.2 homeworks, I have extended until tomorrow. That's Wednesday, January 17th. Um, just um, to make sure that you can seek help with those if you need them. Um, because again, today I, I extended it to today to give you that opportunity, but campus is closed. Um, so I'm extending it one more day um, to let you finish up with those and get some help. So um, if you're still struggling with 2-1 and 2-2 at all, please go seek help um, to finish those no later than tomorrow at midnight. Um, as long as campus is open, I will not be issuing any other extensions for those two homework assignments. Okay, so let's jump into the lecture for Wednesday. Um, we're going to be covering section 2.3, um, which is basic limit laws. So we talked about what a limit is. Um, it means where does y go as x gets really, really close to some number. And remember, x is not actually getting to c. We don't care if the y value exists at c or not. We care where the road goes, right? It's not, it's the journey, not the destination. Um, and so um, that's what a limit means. y gets really close to your limit as x gets really close to um, whatever you're told in the limit here, right? Okay, so and these two, we gave these two facts in section 2.2. So I just want to remind you of those. We'll be using these in just a few minutes. The limit as x approaches c of any number k is equal to k. Again, that's because y equals k is a horizontal line. So it doesn't matter what c value you approach, y is going to go to k. And then the limit as x approaches c of x is equal to c. And again, that's because in the line y equals x, pretend that's y equals x, as you approach c here from the right or the left, you're going to approach c from the top or the bottom. Okay, now um, basic limit laws. Um, we are, these are gonna kind of give us some shortcuts to apply limit laws to an equation, um, specifically um, to deal with those, um, those functions that are really hard to graph. And in section 2.2, we plugged in x values that got closer and closer and closer to our limiting x value. And we plugged them into our function to see what the y values were as x was getting closer and closer and closer to our limiting value to see what the y values were getting closer and closer and closer to. Um, but that was kind of annoying, wasn't it? I don't want to do that. So if there's another way, let's use this instead. And your limit laws are going to kind of give us that shortcut so that we don't have to always use those tables. Um, there may still be times where the table will be a, a necessity, um, but limit laws are going to help us out immensely. All right, so limit laws say, um, if the limit as x approaches c of some function f of x exists, and the limit as x approaches that same c value of some other function g of x also exists, we need to have both of these limits existing before we can apply any of these other laws. If either the limit as x approaches c of f of x does not exist, or the limit as x approaches c of g of x does not exist, then all bets are off. You cannot apply anything from here on out. One last note, note that these are two-sided limits. The limit of f and g has to exist from both sides as x approaches c. Okay, as long as those two limits exist, 
those two two-sided limits exist, then we've got some laws. The sum laws say that if we are taking the sum of our functions, and I want the limit as x approaches c of the sum of these two functions. So say I'm adding together f of x and g of x. What's the limit of these guys? Well, if to add two functions, you add their y values, so to add the limit, to get to the limit of two, the sum of two functions, you're going to take the sum of their two limits. You're going to take the limit as x approaches c of f of x, whatever that is, and you're going to add to it the limit as x approaches c of g of x. And again, you can always do this as long as both individual limits exist, you're good. Okay, now, Constant multiple laws. Uh, constant multiple, this just means when you're multiplying by a number. So for any constant, again, constant means a number, so you can replace that with a real number if you like that better, k, we'll call our, our constant k, then if we are taking the limit as x approaches c of k times f of x, Right, if we want to find the limit as x approaches c of our function times k, some number k, well, then as it turns out, I can pull this constant out of my limit, and this is the same as that number k times the limit as x approaches c of f of x. So you can pull that number out, and it's k times whatever the limit of your function is. Okay. I promise this is going to feel really intuitive when we get to it um, in, in practice. Um, but for right now, we're just going to write it out in kind of mathy terms. All right, so the product law. Just like we can um, take the sum of the separate limits to find the limit of the sum of the functions, if we are taking the limit of the product of two functions, f of x times g of x, right? We're multiplying two functions. Then, as long as both limits exist at c, then I can do the limit as x approaches c of f of x, and take that limit and multiply it by the limit as x approaches c of g of x. This will be the same as finding the limit of just the product of your functions. And the quotient law, what if I'm dividing functions? Well, if I want the limit as x approaches c of f of x divided by g of x, well, I can do the limit as x approaches c of f of x divided by the limit as x approaches c of g of x. I can just divide their limits. However, there is one big thing that we have to be careful of. What do we have to be careful of with fractions? You cannot divide by zero with fractions. If this denominator goes to zero, your head explodes. So we have to make sure that the limit as x approaches c of g of x is not zero. So I'm going to come back up here and I'm going to say if the limit as x approaches c of g of x does not equal zero, then we can apply this quotient rule. But again, if you don't meet this criteria, if the limit as x approaches c of g of x does in fact equal zero, you cannot apply this quotient law. We're going to have to figure out what to do with that um, a couple sections down the line. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, but not this week. <laughs> um, so. For right now, um, you can do the quotient law as long as your the limit of your denominator does not go to zero. Then you're good. And then powers. Um, so it turns out powers, um, whether they are um, nice integer powers or whether they are fractional powers, that, mean, that gives you roots. Um, we have continuous functions. Um, so we have to make sure that if n 
is a positive integer. So then, um, so integer. Do you remember what an integer is? An integer is any um, whole number. It include the integers does include zero, um, but it's any whole number. Integers are not fractions. They do not include fractions. They don't include decimals. It's just the whole numbers. Um, technically, the set of integers includes positive and negative numbers, but we're told here that n has to be strictly positive. So n can be zero, one, two, three, four, on up. Okay, it's a positive whole number is what we're getting at here. Okay, as long as n is a positive whole number and our separate limits of f and g exist, then we've got a few things that we can say here about powers. The limit as x approaches c of f of x to the nth power. So I want the limit of f of x to the nth power. Well, I can actually bring that limit inside the power, and this is going to be the same thing as the limit as x approaches c of my function by itself, that y value to the nth power. Um, you can really um, bring limits in and out of any continuous function um, on its domain, and um, as long as that's the case, we're good. Um, so as long as the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists, you can bring that limit inside an exponent. And as long as that exponent is positive. Now, what would you do if that exponent wasn't positive? Just out of curiosity, what happens if the what happens if n goes negative? Okay, what does a negative exponent mean? Hmm. A negative exponent means it's a reciprocal. The negative exponent would push your limit down to the denominator of a fraction, and you, my friends, would be back up here in a fraction and you would be dealing with the quotient law. So if you have a negative n value, if you have a negative exponent, I want you to rewrite it as a fraction and then make sure that your quotient law exists. Um, sorry, make sure your quotient law applies. And if it does, you can apply your quotient law. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Okay. Um, so, and I guess I'll just write here the limit as x approaches c of f of x to the negative n, this is the limit as x approaches c of 1 over f of x to the n. And so basically you can apply this rule in the denominator and then you'll apply the quotient rule along with all of that. Well, I guess you'll apply the quotient rule to apply it to the numerator and the denominator as long as your denominator is not zero, and then you'll apply the power rule to bring it inside the power. Okay. And then um, what if we have a root? What if you have a fractional exponent? The limit as x approaches c of the nth root of f of x. And again, an nth root, this is the same as f of x to the one over n power, right? A fractional power gives you a root. These two are equivalent. Um, so if you have the limit as x approaches c of the nth root of f of x, as long as the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists, you are good. Um, and this is the same as the nth root of the limit as x approaches c of f of x. Any root is a continuous function on its domain, so we can go ahead and bring that limit inside. You can do that for roots, just like you can exponents, because roots are, in fact, exponents. And again, notice the difference between this and this. This was a negative exponent. Negative exponents give you fractions. Fractions in the exponent give you roots. I just want to make super duper extra clear about that. Okay, so that we know when to apply what. And then we can kind of combine some of these guys. Um, and if you have a rational exponent, so let's say you have limit as x approaches c of your function to the p over q power. That means you have a root 
and an exponent, right? This gives you an exponent. This part gives you a root, but we can actually apply both of these at the same time. A limit of an exponent says you can bring the limit inside and the root says, yeah, you can bring the limit inside. So if you've got both, guess what? You can bring the limit inside. This is the limit as X approaches C of F of X all to the P over Q power. You can apply a rational exponent just like you can any other exponent. Um, and then this last one, I'll throw it out there, even though this is a very specific example of what we just did. The limit as X approaches C of X to the P over Q. Your book separates this one out. So this has the function X to the P over Q power. Well, this is the limit as X approaches C of X all to the P over Q power. What's the limit as X approaches C of X? We talked about that up here. The limit as X approaches C of X, that's right here, is C. So I know that the limit exists and I, so I can apply this thing. The limit as X approaches C of X is just C. So this is gonna be C to the P over Q power. Um, so your book separates this out as a separate power rule. Um, but it's really just a very specific application of this guy. And you can kind of see how these limit laws are going to work um, and how we can apply these guys inside these bigger limit laws. Okay, let's try some of these. Okay, so this first example that I want to do is I want to do the limit as x approaches 2 of x to the third plus f of, I'm oh, sorry, plus 5x plus 7. Okay, well, I have the limit of a whole bunch of stuff here. So are you okay that I'm adding a bunch of stuff, right? I have x to the third plus 5x plus 7. I'm adding three things here. And my limit law, or my limit laws here say as long as the limit of f of x and the limit of g of x both exist, I can kind of give that limit to each thing that I'm adding and or subtracting, right? Um, I didn't mention it up here. If you have a minus here, it also works for subtraction. It's not just um, addition. You can actually do that for subtraction as well. I should have mentioned that up here. Apologies for that. Um, but as long as you are adding or subtracting two things and their individual limits exist, go ahead and split them up. So, um, the limit as x approaches 2 of x to the third. Well, x to the third is a nice unbroken function, right? Nothing weird happens. That limit's going to exist. 5x, that's a line. That's a nice unbroken function. That limit's going to exist. And 7 is a horizontal line. That's a nice smooth function. Nothing weird happens. That limit is going to exist at 2. So all these limits are going to exist at 2. So I can split this up. And I can say this is going to be the limit as x approaches 2 of x to the third plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 5x plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 7. I can apply all of those. I can apply that limit to each individual thing. Now from here, um, let's just look at this first limit for a second. The limit as x approaches 2 of x to the third. Hmm, this has a power in it. Well, I know that if I have a power, I can bring that limit inside the power. Um, so my power here is 3. That's a positive number. Let's go on and bring that limit inside. So this is going to look like the limit as x approaches 2 of x to the third. Right, instead of taking the limit of x to the third, I brought the limit inside that third power and um, it's now on the inside of the exponent with x. You can do that anytime you have an exponent. Okay, well, and then here, let's look at this guy. The limit as x approaches two of five times x. Ooh, this is a constant multiple right? 5 times x. 
that is a number times a function with x in it. So what we can do is we can pull that number outside the limit. So what we can do here is we can take this 5, that's a k, that's our k value here, and we'll pull it outside the limit. This is the same as 5 times the limit as x approaches 2 of x. Right? I can pull the 5 out of the limit. And this, there's nothing to do here. That's the limit as x approaches 2 of 7. Okay, now we can apply these guys. And I know that the limit as x approaches c of any number stays that number. And the limit as x approaches c of x is c. So let's apply that here. So the limit as x approaches 2 of x, that's going to be our c value, which is 2 here. So it's going to be 2 to the third plus 5 times the limit as x approaches 2 of x. That's going to be c. My c value here is 2. Plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 7. The limit of any number is that number. It doesn't change. That's our k value. 7 is our k. And so this is our limit. Now we can figure out what this is. 2 to the third is 2 times 2 is 4 times another 2 is 8. Plus 5 times 2 is 10. Plus that 7, that's going to give us 25 total. That is the value of this limit. Okay, cool. So we can apply our limit laws and kind of pull these things apart and apply our limits one piece at a time um, into um, to do this kind of piece by piece and use our limit laws. Now, I want to point something out here just for a second. So my f of x, I'm like overall, my big function was this whole thing. What if I had taken 2 and plugged it into my function? What if I had taken 2 and plugged it in from the very beginning? What would I have gotten? Well, I would have plugged it in and I would have gotten 2 to the third plus 5 times x, which I'm plugging a 2 in for, um, plus 7. And notice that is exactly what we got. That is 8 plus 10 plus 7. Uh, that, my friends, is 25. Uh, that's not a fluke. Uh, that's a thing. Um, as long as there are no issues with your functions and they're nice and continuous um, and you don't have any holes or breaks or asymptotes or any of those weird things that we saw in section 2.2 that you need to be careful of, you can just like plug the value in, your x value, and the y value you get out is your limit because nothing weird happens. You approach that y value from the left and the right because you're continuous and all roads point to the same place and they actually lead to the same place. So, um, yeah, you can actually just plug your, your x limit here into this whole function and that's going to tell you where you go. Now, if something weird happens, if you have division by zero, that's the big weird thing that's going to happen right here. You have to make sure that you don't have division by zero. If you have division by zero when you plug it in, that means that the limit as x approaches c of your denominator is equal to zero, and this quotient law does not apply. In that case, um, you're going to have to say for now, just in section 2.3, that the limit does not exist. Um, so for those of you that were wondering um, when to write DNE or infinities or anything like that, um, in section 2.3, if you get a denominator of zero when you plug your x value in, you will write DNE does not exist in achieve. Um, we are going to figure out how to deal with a denominator of zero inside a limit um, in a couple of sections. We're not there yet. We'll figure out how to deal with that. Um, I think maybe even in section 2.4. It's going to be in the next couple of sections. So, but not for right now. 2.3, it's a DNE. So, just wanted to give you a heads up for that. Okay. So, that's how we apply your limit laws. You can kind of tear them up piece by piece and then apply those just the limit as x approaches c of k 
equals k and the limit as x approaches c of x equals c um, or you can just plug it in i'm fine with either of those because these two give you the same thing that's kind of how you're going to do these these guys okay now let's try this one let f of x equal x and g of x equal x to the negative one okay find the limit as x approaches zero of f of x times g of x okay well this is the limit as x approaches some number of a product okay well i'm going to come up here and the product law says i can apply that limit to both to both of my functions and just multiply the limits instead of taking the limit of the product now there's no other issues with this one but we still have to make sure that both of our original limits exist so um, this is going to say that this is going to be the limit as x approaches zero of f of x right times the limit as x approaches zero of g of x okay great so we just have to do these limits and so let's do this what's the limit as x approaches zero of f of x well that's the limit as x approaches zero of f of x is x what's the limit as x approaches zero of x well this is x approaches c of x that's just going to give us our c value of zero okay and then we're going to multiply that by the limit as x approaches zero of g of x what's g of x g of x is x to the negative one okay so i have to figure out what this limit is okay well i can't apply my power rule why can't i apply my power rule because I can only apply my power rule if my exponent is positive. My exponent here is negative one, so I cannot apply the power rule. So I have to figure out what else to do. This is where we apply what a negative exponent means, and we're gonna write x to the negative one as one over x, All right? x to the negative one is one over x. Okay, so, that's a fraction. So now we can apply the quotient law, right? So it's gonna be the limit at the top over the limit of the bottom. We just have to make sure that the limit at the bottom isn't zero. So this is going to be zero times the limit as x approaches zero of one over the limit as x approaches zero of x. The limit as x approaches zero of one that's just one. The limit as x approaches zero of x, well, that's the limit as x approaches c of x, which is just our c value of zero. Oh, wait, look. I have a zero in a denominator, right? The limit of my denominator here is zero. And that means I cannot apply the quotient rule to this. That means we are stuck for right now. And for in section 2.3, anytime you encounter a denominator of zero, you are going to say that your limit does not exist. And again, this is a section 2.3 thing, and we are going to learn how to deal with that in another section or so. Okay, so that's kind of how we deal with limits. Now, for those of you that print out the notes, you might say, Susan, that's the end of our notes. Well, I was going to do an in-class activity tomorrow. Um, since I'm not going to be there, what I did was I posted the 2.3 in-class worksheet for you. And so in D2L, so what I want you to do is... Um, either print out or work through the section 2.3 in-class worksheet with me. Um, that's what we're going to work through now. Um, and I would like you to approach this as an in-class activity. What I want you to do is pause this video. I want you to use 
what I just went through. And I want you to try these guys. Now I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you here. And I'm going to say that these are much more challenging than the ones that we just did, but I want you to lean on the limit laws and I want you to do your best with them. I want you to bring the limit inside where you know you can bring the limit inside. I want you to split things up where you know you can split things up. Um, and I want you to plug things in and see what happens. And honestly, as long as you can plug your X value in and nothing weird happens, that is you don't divide by zero, that Y value is your limit. So uh, I want you to try this, pause it, give this number one, A through F a go. And then when you're ready and you've tried this, you've turned your brain on, then I want you to hit play and come back to me. Okay, hopefully you've turned your brain on, you've tried these, and you've started to think about how these work. Okay, so let's work through a few of these. So the limit as x approaches 2 of the square root of x to the third plus 5x plus 7. Okay, why well, have the limit of a root? Okay, what, are, what did our limit laws say about the limit of a root? Well, it said that you could bring the limit inside a root. So let's bring the limit inside the root. This is equal to the square root of the limit as x approaches 2 of x to the third plus 5x plus 7. I can bring that limit inside the root because it's a nice continuous function. And now the limit as x to, of x to the third plus 5x plus 7 this is actually the same limit that we just did in class. I don't know if you recognize that or not. If you went back through it, hopefully you split it all up. Um, but this is going to be the same as the square root of this limit is going to be what we get when we plug 2 in. It's going to be a limit of 2 to the third plus 5 times 2 plus 7. And that's going to be the square root of 8 plus 10 plus 7, which we found was the square root of 25 which means that this is five. And if your brain wants to split this up and take the limit of x to the third, plus the limit of five x, plus the limit of seven and, and pull it apart and apply um, the limit to each of those, that's totally fine. Um, take it to the place where your brain likes the best, right? If you wanna add this step in, if your brain wants you to do this, then I want you to do that, right? Um, so kind of take this to where it's making sense in your brain right now. Add in as many of those in-between steps as you need. Um, but if your brain can take you right here immediately, I'm okay with that. Um, cause we're kind of working to the point of, uh, don't take a shortcut unless you know where it goes. <laughs> um, cause I don't want you to get completely lost. Um, but once you know where things go, feel free to take shortcuts. I'm okay with that. Cause after section 2.3, I'm going to kind of expect you to take those shortcuts. Okay. And then let's do this next one. The limit as x approaches negative 1 of this guy, x plus 6 over 2 times x to the fourth. Okay, our limit laws. We have a quotient. We're dividing two things. Quotient rule says that we can take the limit as x approaches negative 1 of the numerator divided by the limit as x approaches negative 1 of our denominator. And again, so we can take the limit of each of these. Limit of our numerator. The limit of as x approaches negative 1 of x plus 1, that's going to be what we get when we plug it in. It's going to be the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x plus the limit as x approaches negative 1 of 1. Limit as x approaches negative 1 of x is negative 1. The limit as x approaches negative 1 of 1 is 1. And we're going to divide by the limit as x approaches negative 1 of 2x to the 4th. 
Again, if you want this middle step, it's going to be 2 times the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x to the fourth, which is going to be 2 times the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x, that whole limit to the fourth. And what you're going to do is you're going to take the limit as x approaches negative 1 of x, and you're going to get negative 1. You're going to take it to the fourth power, and then you're going to multiply by 2 which is what you get when you plug it in here. Okay, so overall, what we get here is a zero on the top divided by two times one. What's zero divided by two? Is that a DNE? No, that's a zero. We can divide zero by other things. We cannot divide other things by zero. Um, difference here is Taking zero and dividing by two says I have zero objects that I'm distributing among two people. How many objects does each person get? Well, I have zero objects, so that means each person gets zero items. Okay, if I had two divided by zero, if this had been upside down and the zero had been on the bottom, that says I have two objects that I am distributing among zero people. How many objects does each person get? And you would say, I don't know, there's no people. Do they get zero items? Do they get all two of the items? Do they get infinity items? Do they get one item? Do they get seven items? I don't know, there's no people, right? It's, it's a conundrum. So that's why we can't divide by zero, but we can divide zero by other things. It's a kind of a philosophical, what does it mean? Cool. How about C? The limit as T approaches three of T to the negative one fourth, times t plus 5 to the one-third. Okay, this looks a little scary. I'm feeling a little bit anxious about this. You can take a deep breath. What's happening here? I have t to the negative one-fourth times t plus 5 to the one-third. I'm multiplying two things. So what do our limit laws say when we multiply two things? It's saying you multiply their separate limits. So I'm gonna say, okay, let's multiply their separate limits. Times the limit as t goes to three of t plus five to the one third. Okay, now let's do each of these separately. I feel better about doing these individually. So ignore that other limit for now. We're just looking at this first one. If you need to cover up the other one, do it. It'll help your brain. So if we have the limit as t approaches three of t to the negative one fourth, well, I don't have a I don't have a law for this. I have a negative exponent here. So we have to rewrite this. That is the same as the limit as t approaches three of one over t to the positive one-fourth. A negative exponent gives us a reciprocal. This is what that means. Okay, let's just keep rocking with this one. Um, if I take three, right, if I did the limit of the numerator over the limit of the denominator, I have to make sure that this limit doesn't go to zero. What's the limit as t approaches three of t to the one-fourth? Well, I'm going to bring that limit inside the one-fourth power and I'm going to get the limit as t approaches 3 of t to the 1 fourth power. What is the limit as t approaches 3 of t? Well, it's 3. So I'm going to have 3 to the 1 fourth power here, right? I'm going to get whatever I get when I plug it in. This is not 0. That's okay. I'm just going to make a little note of that. That's not 0, which makes us happy, and we can continue on. And so let's keep moving here. On this other side, the limit as t approaches 3 of t plus 5 to the one-third power. The one-third power is a root. I can bring that limit inside the root. So this is going to be the limit as t approaches 3 of t plus 5 all to the one-third power. What's the, what's the limit as t approaches 3 of t plus 5? Well, it's going to be the limit as t approaches 3 of t, which is 3 plus the limit as t approaches 3 of 5, which is 5, all to the one-third power. So this is 8 to the one-third power over 3 to the one-fourth power. 
And then from here, the eight to the one third power, that's the cube root of eight, that's two. And three to the one fourth power, that's the fourth root of three, which is the fourth root of three, that's not a nice number. And that is as simple as we go. That is this limit. Again, essentially you're plugging that three into T everywhere and evaluating it. And just a, a heads up, most of the time I'm going to want you to leave these exact. I do not want you to, to plug the fourth root of three into your calculator and give me a decimal. I want exact numbers, not rounded numbers. Um, and that'll help you in Alex, or not Alex, in Achieve, sorry, um, as well. Because um, if you keep it exact until the end, even if it wants a decimal, then just plug this into your calculator and you'll get an, a much more exact answer and you won't have any rounding error. All right, let's try D. The limit as X approaches one of this lovely thing. Again, looks scary. <sighs> Take a deep breath. What's happening here? I have the limit of something on top divided by something on the bottom. Limit laws say I can take the limit that I have of the top divided by the limit as x approaches one of the bottom. Okay, let's do this one at a time. Let's start at the top. The limit as x approaches one on top. Hopefully you've started to see that we can take that one and plug it in here. I've got a root addition and subtraction. All of those things are covered by our limit laws. Nothing weird happens. We are good. So let's plug that in. And I'm going to get the square root of 1 plus 1 minus 1 up top. And then the limit as x approaches 1 of 2x is going to be 2 times 1, which is 2. And then from here, we just simplify. This is the square root of 2 minus 1 over 2. And again, I'd want you to just leave that for me. Uh, it's not a super nice number, um, so just leave that for me. And if, if Achieve wants you to put a decimal in, go ahead and plug that into your calculator. If you do that, don't forget to put parentheses around the top. Um, and then divide by 2 to get a decimal. And you can put that into Achieve if it wants a decimal. Um, if it wants exact, leave it just like this. Okay, hopefully you're starting to feel a little more comfortable with these. We are just plugging this in, folks. Okay, so let's try this one. The limit as x approaches 8 of 3x to the 2 thirds minus 16x to the negative 1. I'm subtracting a couple things. I've got this minus something else. I can do the limit as x approaches 8 of 3x to the 2 thirds minus the limit as x approaches 8 of 16 times x to the negative 1. I'm going to rewrite that as a fraction because I know that when I have negative exponents, just like I did up here, I had to rewrite it. So let's go ahead and rewrite this off the bat. This is going to be 16 over x to the first. That's how we rewrite that as a fraction. Okay, now let's do this. The limit as x approaches 8 of 3 times x to the 2 thirds is 3 times whatever 8 to the 2 thirds power is. Minus the limit as x approaches 8 of 16 over x is whatever 16 over 8 is. All right, 8 to the 2 thirds power. This is the cube root of 8 squared. The cube root of 8 is 2. When you square 2, you get 4. This is just 4. So uh, 16 divided by 8, that's 2. This is 12 minus 2. That's 10. Not nearly as scary as it looked. Okay. And then finally, this last one, the limit as x approaches one half of these guys. Oh, and I didn't mention this here. I guess I should have actually in both of these. Um, we had to make sure that this was not zero, right? And it wasn't, so we could apply our quotient rule before we plugged it in. And then up here we had another quotient, and we just had to make sure that that wasn't equal to zero before we did this. All right. Sorry, just wanted to um, make sure that we were good with that um, because I want to make sure that I'm pointing out that we are following our limit laws and only applying them when we can. But we were good on all of these. 
All right, so this last one, the limit as x approaches one half of 4x plus 1 times 6x minus 1. We're multiplying a couple things. So this is going to be the limit as x approaches one half of my first thing times the limit as x approaches one half of my second thing. And then let's do the limit of each of these. As x approaches one half, 4x plus 1 is going to be 4 times one half plus 1. And I'm going to multiply that by, as x approaches 1 half of 6x minus 1, that's going to go to 6 times 1 half minus 1. Now just fight through the arithmetic. This is 2 plus 1. That other side is 3 minus 1. 3 times 2 is 6, y'all, and that's it. So limits. Your first line of defense is to plug it in. As scary as it is, go ahead and plug in that x value. As long as nothing goes weird and you don't divide by zero, you don't have the square root of a negative number, you, as long as something weird doesn't happen that you know you are not mathematically allowed to do, you are good. And if you end up with a zero in the denominator, the answer is the limit does not exist. <laughs> okay, so that's kind of the, um, the big idea here. Plug it in. And whatever you get out, that's your answer. If you get a zero in the denominator, a negative inside of a square root, um, any forbidden mathematical operation, then the limit does not exist. Okay. And then last thing here, I want to go through a couple of these so that you have seen these before. Given that the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x equals 3. All right, so I don't know what the function f of x looks like. But I do know the limit as x approaches 4 of this function is 3. That means the limit exists from both sides, and both sides, my y values point to 3. Okay? And the limit as x approaches 4, the same y value, sorry, the same x value, of this other function g of x is 1. I don't know what g of x is, but I know that the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x is 1. Okay, we have to find the value of each of these following limits. Okay, I have to figure out the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x times g of x is. How am I going to do this if I don't know what f of x and g of x are? Well, we can apply our, x, our uh, limit laws, right? I have the limit as x approaches 4 of one thing times another thing. So we can do the limit as x approaches 4 of thing 1 times the limit as x approaches 4 of thing 2. Limit laws, right? The limit of the first one times the limit of the second one. As long as each of these individual limits exist, we're good. So let's see what these lim individual limits are. What's the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x? Well, that's right here. That's just 3. Then I'm going to multiply by the limit as x approaches 4 of g. That's over here. That's just 1. So what is this limit? Yep, it's 3. You're just going to tear these apart and apply this just like you would before. So I want you to apply your limit laws and start to pull these guys apart. So pause the video here. Try to work through b, c, d, and e for me real quick. And then when you feel like you have done all you can do and you have turned your brain on and you have tried this, then I want you to push play and come back to me and see how you did. All right, y'all. You have paused this and you've turned your brain on and you've done your work. Let's see how you did. Okay, limit as x approaches 4 of 2 times f of x plus 3 times g of x. This looks a little scary, but what's happening? I'm taking the limit as x approaches 4 of thing 1 plus thing 2. I know how to do that. That's going to be the limit as x approaches 4 of thing 1 plus the limit as x approaches 4 of thing 2. Okay, the limit as x approaches 4 of 2f of x 
I don't have that. I don't, I don't have two f of x. I just have f of x. But I have a constant multiple rule that says if you have a number inside your limit, pull it out. So this is going to be 2 times the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x. I can do that same thing here. I've got a number in here. I can pull that out of my limit. So this is going to be 2 times the limit as x approaches 4 of f of x. Oh, y'all, we know what this is. What is the limit as x approaches 4 of f? Yeah, it's just 3. And then I'm going to add that to 3 times, what's the limit as x approaches 4 of g? Yeah, that's just 1. So this is going to be 2 times 3. Go, brain, go. I think that's 6. <laughs> I'm struggling right now. And then plus 3 times 1, that's 3. And 6 plus 3 is 9. Okay. Basic math, right? It's the hard part. Okay. Well, that wasn't as bad as it felt at the beginning. Again, look at the structure and then apply your limit laws. Start to pull it apart and deal with it piece by piece. It's going to feel so much better once you start to pull it apart and focus your brain on small pieces of this. Let's try this last one. Well, not this last one, this last row. <laughs> the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x over x squared. Well, I've got thing one divided by thing two. Let's see if we can apply the quotient rule. I just need to make sure that the bottom isn't zero. So I'm going to do the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x, right? Limit at the top over the limit as x approaches 4 of x squared. Okay. Well, the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x. Do I know that? Yeah, that's right here. That's one. And the limit as x approaches 4 of x squared. Do I know that? Yep, I can plug it in. The limit as x approaches 4 of x squared is the limit as x approaches 4 of x, which is 4, squared, which is 16. You can just plug it in. That's a function. Plug it in, just like we did above. So you might have a mix of these unknown functions that you have to come up here for and known functions that you can plug in just like we did before. It's okay. Do them one at a time. Make your brain make that switch. And this is 1 over 16. That's not a super lovely number. Just put a box around it. If achieve wants a decimal, put it in your calculator and give it a decimal. Round it to wherever it wants it. Okay. And again, I kind of um, overlooked this, but again, this in here, this was not zero. And that's why we could continue on with the problem. If that had been zero, we would have hit the brakes and said, nope, can't do this DNA. All right, let's do D. Again, look scary. Don't panic. I've got thing one divided by thing two. So I'm going to do the limit as X approaches four at the top. divided by the limit as x approaches 4 of the bottom. Okay, well, this still looks kind of scary, and especially I've got an f of x and I've got a 1. That's confusing to me, so I'm going to pull this apart even more. So focus on the top for me for a sec. The limit as x approaches 4 of f of x plus 1. I've got the limit of thing 1 plus thing 2, so I can do the limit of thing one plus the limit of thing two. That's the top. I can handle that. We'll come back to that. And then on the bottom, again, this looks big and scary, but we can pull it apart. I've got the, sorry, I don't need another equal sign. I've already got one up there. Um, and then I've got the limit of three times G of X minus nine. So I'll do the limit of the first thing minus the limit of the second thing. Notice there's a three in here. I'm going to skip a step. I'm going to pull the three out of the limit when I apply it to my first piece. Hopefully you're ready for that step. Minus the limit as x approaches four of nine. Right, I applied the limit to each piece and then I pulled that three out. That's how I got here. Now we can do these separately. What's the limit as x approaches four of f? That's three. Plus, what's the limit as x approaches 4 of 1? That's 1. 
over three times. What's the limit as x approaches four of g? X approaches four of g, that's this guy, that's one. Minus, what's the limit as x approaches four of nine? You got it, it's nine. And then we can do the arithmetic here. We will have four over three minus nine is negative six. That simplifies to negative two thirds. And that is our answer here. It's less scary, right? You got this. And then party. E. The limit of thing one divided by thing two. So I'm going to do the limit of the top. Thing one divided by the limit of the bottom. Minus one. Okay. And again, on the bottom, you'll do the limit of g of x minus the limit of y. Okay, so on top, what's the limit as x approaches 4 of f? That's up here. That's 3. And on the bottom, the limit as x approaches 4 of g of x. Limit as x approaches 4 of g, that's 1. Minus the limit as x approaches 4 of 1, that's 1. Hmm, something weird happens here. What happens? This is zero, right? One minus one. I've got a zero on the bottom. Three divided by zero. I can't do that. My head explodes. I have no people. I don't know how many things they get. So what that means is that this limit does not exist for now. Anytime you can't apply your limit laws, you're going to say that the limit does not exist just for section 2.3. We're going to figure out how to deal with that um, in a little bit when we get a little bit further on in our uh, calculus journey here. Okay. So that is section 2.3. Um, now, um, Section 2.4 um, is a little bit heavier. So I kind of want to start a little bit of section 2.4 to make sure that we can get through it all on Friday um, in a way that makes sense, right? Um, so this is section 2.3. I want you to start on the homework for section 2.3. You got everything that you need to do that now. Okay, I also just want to start this very beginning part of section 2.4. Okay, section 2.4 is limits and continuity, and I'm just going to do up to, let me get to the point where I can write on this, I'm only going to do up to here. Oops, I turned this off, here we go. I'm only going to do up to here. Technology. It's fantastic. Okay, so I'm only going to do this very first part about what it means to be continuous. Okay, so what does it mean for a function to be continuous? With what you know, you should know what the word continuous means thus far, at least have an idea of what it means. You should have seen this before. For a function to be continuous, it means it's all one piece, right? It's unbroken. It's not broken into multiple sections, right? You can draw the whole thing without lifting up your pencil. It is one unbroken piece. Okay. Now, let's get into what the definition of, of continuity is in calculus. This is going to be a more technical definition. So, the calculus definition of continuity. If a function f of x is defined on an open interval containing C. Ooh, that's kind of heavy. Our function is defined. Defined, that means it has a Y value. So every X value on this open interval containing C has a Y value that goes with it. Okay, so we're defined. Every X has a Y on an open interval containing C. Okay, open interval means that we're talking from x equals, let's just say a 
to x equals b, right? And we are not including the endpoints. Open here means that these are parentheses. We don't have to have points at our ends. We could have open circles at our ends. That's okay. Okay, so we have an open interval containing C. That means C is somewhere between our endpoints A and B, right? So everything from A to B has a Y value, and C is between A and B. But A and B don't have to have Y values that go with them. That's the parenthesis part. Okay, if we have that, then our function F is continuous at x equals c. We talk about continuity at a single point. Our function f is continuous at the point x equals c if the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals f of c. Hmm. Is that it? Yeah, that's it, guys. That's all this says. Okay, as long as our function has y values for every x value between a and b, but not necessarily at the endpoints, then our function is continuous at a point between our endpoints as long as the limit as x approaches c of f of x. Note, this is a two-sided limit. This is important. That's a two-sided limit. I need that two-sided limit to be equal to f of c. It has to be equal to the y value at x equals c. Okay, that's all continuity means. The two-sided limit is equal to your y value there. Great, well that sounds simple but it's actually way more complicated than it looks. I know this looks really simple and easy, but using it is actually kind of difficult because any time that you want to show that something is continuous using this definition, you actually have to show three separate things. First thing, well, we have to show that f of c exists. We have to show that c has a y value that goes with it, right? When you plug in x equals c, you have a y value that comes out. You are defined at x equals c. That's what you have to show first. Okay, so you have to show that your y value exists. And then you have to show that your two-sided limit exists, right? The limit as x approaches c of f of x also exists. That's the second thing that you have to show. And again, this is a two-sided limit. You have to check both sides must exist. This cannot be a DNE situation for the two-sided limit. Now, once you have made sure that f of c exists, and this thing is real, <laughs> and you have made sure that the limit as x approaches c of f of x exists and that this side is a real thing, then you have to show that they're equal, right? The limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. The limit equals the y value there. That's the last thing that you have to show. If your limit and your y value don't match, then you are not continuous there. And you need to show all three of these things to use the limit definition of continuity. Um, and that's what we're doing here. So this is the calculus definition of what it means to be um, continuous. I think that's where I'm gonna stop for now. We will pick this up on Friday. Hopefully I will be um, back in action and able to return to you on Friday, and I will see you in class. So um, get going on section 2.3, and then I'll see you Friday for section 2.4. Have a good day, y'all.